So today is Palm Sunday. You probably noticed some palms around here, so that's, that's part of Palm Sunday, all right? And you're going to think, well, he must be going to be preaching today about Jesus entering into the city. Now, I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and then I'm going to start where we left off last week uh, for the crucifixion. And part of the problem is with that is we come on to Palm Sunday, and of course we understand that that's when Jesus entered into the city, and of course he had him go get a coat that had never been ridden, and he rode up on that coat, and they threw out their coats and palms, and they praised him and worshipped him as a king. And it was probably the first and only time that he ever got truly treated like a king. And then, as he got into the city, Holy Week starts, and now as we, this starts Holy Week now, and so as we go on into this week, we can never forget about everything that happened during the crucifixion. Next week, of course, is Easter, and that's Resurrection Sunday, and we'll be talking about that. The tomb was empty, praise God, and uh, Christ is on the right hand of the Father, and we'll be talking about that. This week, as I said, we're going to start off in Mark 15, start with verse 33 in just a second here, and uh, as we go to Mark 15, 33, it gives us a timeline and a time frame here. There's some of this I think we read over and we don't think about it enough because there's a lot that happens here. So at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. I want you to think about that. Wouldn't you think that would be just a little bit weird? Let's say on any given day that you and I were here on this old earth, that at noon, all of a sudden, it gets dark. And I'm not talking about a little dark. Darkness fell upon it. There was no light. It was done away with. At the time of day, that normally is pretty much the brightest time. For three hours, they lived in darkness. Now listen, folks, they didn't have electricity. They didn't have those things that we have today. It got dark outside. It got dark inside. It got dark wherever they were. It was dark for three hours. Now, I don't know about you, but wouldn't that make you think a little bit? Wouldn't it make you at least kind of wonder what's going on? Wouldn't it make you wonder what's happening? But also, all those crowds of people that were there for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, it was dark as he hung on the cross, it was dark. Three hours. Because that's really what it is without Jesus. Because Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. And darkness was there and that's all there was. You could turn all the lights off in this building, we could still see from the light outside. Not as good, but we could still see. You could turn the lights off about anywhere, and if there's any windows at all, you would still have some light that penetrated in. But at this time, there was no light anywhere, period. So for three hours, people are in darkness. Now, I would think even lost people, that would make them think something, wouldn't it? Could this Jesus really be the king of kings? Could Jesus that we've put on the cross truly be the Messiah. I would think they would have to at least think about that. It says, then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabathion, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I, I really believe it was sad that Jesus was nailed to a cross. It was sad that before that he was beaten almost to death. It was sad that he fell under the weight of a cross that probably weighed, they say, somewhere between 150 and 175 pounds and had to have help for it to be carried to the hill of Golgotha. It was sad that as they hung him on the cross, and even before that, they mocked him. It was sad that he did all those things, but the saddest thing of all of this, 
He said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The only t time in the history of time, the only time in creation, the only time that Jesus and God were not one. Think about that. The only time many of us have lost loved ones and they died and we spent many years with them and there's a loss when that person dies. But think about being the Savior of the world, God himself, and now the Father has to turn his head upon him. Why did he have to turn his head? Because he represented your and my sin. And God could not look upon him at that time because he became sin for you and I, that when we die and we, re we receive him as Lord and Savior before that, when we die, we'll end up in eternity with him in heaven. <laughs> Praise God. Could you imagine? Here's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, Father, if there's any way, take this cup from me. If there's any other way, take this. We find Jesus then that's ran through a kangaroo court, for lack of other words, that had never sinned, had never done any wrong, and yet he was put on the cross as a sinless man for you and I who are sinful. He died on that cross for us, and we're going to see that in just a moment. As we go on, Said so some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. He wasn't calling for the prophet Elijah. He was calling out to the Father, wondering for the first time in eternity or forever again in eternity, God forsaken him while he hung on the cross. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and holding it up to him on a reed stick so they could drink. What a, he said, let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. They're still making fun of him. They just went through three hours of darkness. Never before had there ever been three hours of darkness at noon to three. Never again has there ever been three hours of darkness from noon to three. But I think it is about the same in our lives when we have darkness in our lives, when we run away from Christ and we run away from the things of God, and as we're running away from the things of God, we're in darkness in our lives. And even when that light comes back to us, we want to mock him and what's happening. And that's exactly what they were doing. They mocked him. Will Elijah come and take him down? Let me tell you the old songs that we used to sing that uh, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. I want to tell you that's no joke. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have destroyed the world to set him free. But he loved you and I enough that he hung up on that cross. He took those, that abuse. He took everything that they had to offer him, except for he didn't take that wine or gall that they gave him to drink. He did that not for himself. He did that for you and I. Amen. Amen. Praise God. What a Savior. I want to tell you, You could never ask me to do that for you. I'm sorry. And I don't believe I could ask you to do that for me. But I'll tell you this. Jesus did it for you. Amen. And Jesus did it for me. And he hung up on that cross. And even when the father had to turn his head, he still hung there for you and I. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry. And breathed his last. 
And when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, This man truly was the Son of God. No truer words were ever spoken. That officer that disbelieved, that officer that I'm sure was one of the ones making fun of him, spitting upon him, probably was one of the ones that beat him. That same guy, after going through that darkness in life for everyone, seeing how Jesus gave up his life for you and I, says this man truly was the Son of God. I want to ask you today, do you know truly that Jesus was the Son of God? Truly enough that you'll live your lives for him. Truly enough that you'll give everything over to him. Truly enough that you'll say, I don't want to be a part of this world. I want to be who God has created me to be. As we go on in verse 40, it says, Some women were there watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. They had been followers of Jesus and had cared for him while he was in Galilee. And many other women who had, made, who had come with him to Jerusalem were also there. The Bible's just stating there were people there that had walked with him. There was a lot of the ladies that attended to him. Said this all happened on Friday, the day of preparation. The day before the Sabbath, as evening approached. And Joseph of Amaria took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the high council, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. And Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead. Now, why was it? Because it really hadn't been that long. You realize if you look in history, there's people that took from hours to even days before they died. One of the reasons that they usually broke the legs of those on the cross is so that they would die faster. It would hurry it up. If you remember, they didn't have to break Jesus' legs. You see, they didn't take his life. Now they beat him almost to death. They nailed him on the cross. They mocked him. He stood for our sins, and as he hung there, they didn't have to break his legs because Jesus picked the time and died for your and my sins. I want to tell you, Jesus is the one that's in control, and Jesus is in control of us today if we'll let him be. In verse 45, it says, the officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, so Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. And Joseph brought a long sheet of linen cloth. And then he took Jesus' body down from the cross. He wrapped it in the cloth and laid it in the tomb that had been carved out of the rock. And then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus' body was laid. You see, as they were watching where Jesus' body was laid, that's the reason next week we're going to go start where they come to the tomb. They knew where he was at. They knew where to go back. Of course, when they go back, Jesus is not there, and that's what we're going to talk about next week. But the thing I want to mention today again, I want us to think about this. Many of us say that we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's an easy thing to say. Most of that's because one day, who knows when, could have been many years ago, could have been just a week or two ago, we walked down an aisle and took somebody's hand and we prayed what we call the sinner's prayer and we asked Jesus to come into our heart, forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and he did that. But there's sometimes that people came down the aisle and they say that, but it's from emotions, it's because somebody else did. I can't tell you how many times later in life I hear people say, I did it because so-and-so did it, and I wanted to be like them, I wanted to be baptized. 
not realizing that it's not that water that does it. It's the blood of Jesus as he died on the cross for our sins that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's his blood that makes us whole. And then after we know him and we follow him in believer's baptism, we are to live our lives according to his word. But I want to ask you today, have you been going through some darkness in your life? Have you been going through some times in your life where there's been darkness, when there's been, it seems like everything's went wrong instead of right. It seems like when you pray, they don't reach even the ceiling. Oh, I want to tell you. Sometimes it seems like we pray and we're just numb. Well, the way we get rid of that is we confess the unconfessed sins before a holy God. And God holds us back to him. You remember in God's word where it said he tore the temple curtain from the top to the bottom? Let me tell you, that happened when Jesus gave up his life. And you and I need to know the reason that was done is because no man could have reached some 30 feet up, tore that thing from the top to the bottom. It was God himself that opened the curtain. No more was there a high priest that had to be go through a cleansing to be able to go in even once a year into the holies of holies. You and I get to go into God, to the holies of holies in the presence of God, and our lives need to be more like Him and more like He has chose for us to be. If your life is not being lived for God, then now's the time to give it over to Him. Even if you're trying and you don't know why you can't, let me tell you, God's the answer and the only answer for you and I to get totally right with Almighty God. <laughs> Praise God we don't have to go to another person and tell them our sins, that he can go to God with our sins. Jesus says, I'm the only mediator between God and man. And I want to tell you, you and I need to go to Jesus Christ and say, God, forgive me of the sins in my life that I might serve you with all my life. Boy, I want to tell you something. You can come to church every day of the week and it won't do you any good unless you give your life over to Jesus. You can come to church every time the doors are open and you can look better than everybody else, but it's what's in here that makes the difference. You and I need to give everything over to God that God might continue to work in and around us. We're having a revival in a few weeks here. We need to get excited about God. We need to get ready. We need God to do a work within us that people will want what we have. I'm just going to ask you to ask yourself this question and look at your own life. When people see you, do they see you, Jesus? Number one, when people see you, are they seeing something they want? Or are they trying to get away from you? Because they even know you're not who you think you are. Maybe it's time that we finally get to the point. We say, God, I want to give you my all. I want to give you my everything. Help me, Lord, do that for you. Help me to give you the glory. Help me, Lord, to quit holding back. 